Intellectual property, as you will read this unit, is a concept that was conceived hundreds of years ago. Copyright, the right of the creator to control the products they create, is just one of the doctrines categorized as intellectual property rights. As you will later see, intellectual property also refers to patents, trademarks, and trade secrets. This week's learning objectives are listed here. I'm not going to read them to you because you can read. <laughs> so what's the purpose of copyright? Most people believe that the purpose is to give authors and artists credit for their work and give them the right to protect these works from others who want to steal them without paying. But as you will learn, that's never been the case. As the History of IP article from the National Paralegal College explains, laws regarding intellectual property existed hundreds of years before the U.S. was founded. The purpose of the laws at that point in time, however, greatly differed from the purpose of IP laws when the U.S. was founded. As you will read, the purpose of copyright law, according to the Copyright Clause, which is in the Constitution, was to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries from the Constitution. The inclusion of this clause in the Constitution is the basis for all copyright and intellectual protection today. Obviously, however, the Founding Fathers lived in an entirely different world. Think about it. Very little printing, no internet, no digital anything. You might be wondering how something that was written in the late 1700s could possibly apply to today's world. Therein lies the complexity of IP. The printing press was invented by Gutenberg around 1440. This invention was phenomenal, phenomenal because prior to that, the only books that existed were hand copied by monks. It was a laborious process that was controlled by the religious establishments at the time. As you can imagine, controlling the ability to create and distribute printed materials was a great source of power. This was easily controlled when the monks were hand copying books. But once the printing press was invented, anyone who had a printing press could reproduce political and religious ideologies. Governments were not happy with losing the power to control what was printed and distributed. The laws during the 1500s were meant to concentrate the power to disseminate ideas, ideas that might be contrary to the current government or the religion in power you will read about the various laws that were developed in England at that time. When the colonists created their own laws, each colony passed its own intellectual property rights. You're also going to read about how this was detrimental to the value of actual IP. After all, if my book only had protection in the state of Pennsylvania and anyone could reproduce it freely in New York, I, as the author, did not have much protection. The Founding Fathers, the men who were writing the Constitution, knew that they had to do something to regulate intellectual property in order to make a strong, economically sound country. However, they did not all feel the same way about government intervention in citizens' lives. Remember, they left England to escape government control of daily life. They were fearful of monopolies, too, and copyright was akin to a monopoly on, at that time, books and printing. Noah Webster, yes, the Webster Dictionary guy, as well as some other individuals had been pressing the states to create copyright protection because obviously it had to do with commerce. The clause for copyright, however, was not in the first draft of the Constitution, but shortly thereafter, James Madison proposed it was added without much debate at that time because it, the debate had already occurred. Please refer to the reading what the Founding Fathers thought for more on this development. In the end, they realized that strong intellectual property laws were needed for commerce and progress to occur. Thus, the specific wording of the source of IP power in the Constitution. 
Your textbook does an excellent job of describing several justifications for copyright, namely the economic basis, incentive to create, property theories, and philosophical justifications such as personality theories and natural rights theories. It's important to remember that intellectual property protects creations of the human mind. There are four basic types of intellectual property. The rights bestowed to the creator of the IP are the exclusive right to use, in the case of trademarks and trade secrets, and reproduce, in the case of copyrights and patents. This semester you're going to learn about four IP types with an emphasis on copyright, as it is the most applicable to technical writing and communication. Because the federal government was given the sole right to regulate IP, as evidenced by the Copyright Clause in the Constitution, the statutes and regulations applicable to it are created by the federal government only and are regulated by federal courts and agencies. You will see trademark law is concentrated in Chapter uh, 22 of Title 15 of the U.S. Code, copyright takes up all of Title 17, and patent law is in Title 35. There are also two federal administrative agencies that play a role in the regulation of copyright and patents. The first is the United States Patent and Trademark Office. They create the procedures under which patents are granted. It, they decide if a specific patent is approved or not. And the United States Copyright Office, which is a branch of the Library of Congress, which is responsible for keeping a copy of every work that is registered with the department, for providing information to the public about copyrighted work, and for evaluating every submission to determine if it's eligible for copyright protection. You're also going to read about another type of law that's not statute or regulation, but very important. This is case law. Case law is founded on the principle of stare decisis, a Latin term that means stand by things decided. Case law are precedents, the decisions that had been made by previous court rulings. This means that courts will follow or at least consider higher courts' previous decisions on cases. Case law is the reason you see many cases referring to previously decided cases to make justification for their decision. However, not just any court's ruling has this power. Only the 13th Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, which consider decisions made by the federal district courts, and the U.S. Supreme Court, which considers decisions made by the appeal courts, create case law. So the lower court would look to case law created by the higher court's decisions. For example, if there is a case in the federal district court, the federal district court will look at the precedents that were decided by the federal courts of appeals and use those to guide their ruling. They will not look at other federal district court decisions because they have to look to a higher court. For Americans, however, IP protection is needed across the globe. We live in a global marketplace. It's important to understand that laws made in the U.S. do not have to be honored by foreign countries. The issues that this causes are very similar to those when each state had their own IP laws. Without widespread acceptance of a person's ownership rights to IP, it's not worth very much. Governments realize this and have attempted to remediate this through the creation of treaties. Treaties are agreements entered into by federal governments. In the U.S., it would be agreed to by the President and ratified by the Senate. They also provide a source of intellectual property law. The Paris Convention, the Berne Convention, and the WIPO Copyright Treaty are examples of such treaties. The rights afforded to Americans for their IP abroad are controlled by these treaties only in the countries that are signatory to them. So if a country has not signed to agree with the treaty, they don't have to. So you're soon going to see the complexities of intellectual property law as you review the course readings. I want to let you know not to be alarmed by the volume of them or the seemingly endless gray areas that seem to come up. Okay. Understand that intellectual property, um, including the copyright law that we are studying to begin with, um, has many of these gray areas. 
Um, everything is not black and white in making a decision. That's why we have courts looking to other courts' rulings, etc. So go ahead and review the readings um, and then get started on the discussion.